Coming in at number 10, we have Namor the Submariner. Now, if you just look at his record on paper, Namor has a pretty villainous track record. A half mutant and half Atlantean warrior, he's constantly fighting the Fantastic Four, frequently fighting the Avengers, and has occasionally kidnapped the Invisible Woman at least once or twice. However, as leader of the Atlantean people, many of these conflicts only came about as Namor sought to do what was best for his followers and countrymen, and has in recent years become an ally to the Avengers, the Defenders, the Illuminati, and many other superhero groups. Just as long as you don't do anything to harm Atlantis, Namor can be an incredibly useful and powerful friend to have in your corner. At number 9, we have the beloved vampire killer known as Blade. Born as a human vampire hybrid named Eric Brooks, Blade has all of the powers of a Marvel Universe vampire with nearly none of the negative side effects. He possesses superhuman strength and speed, with all of his senses heightened to make him a perfect predator while being immune to damage from sunlight, silver, or holy artifacts that would instantly turn a regular vampire powerless. While he does still need the nutrients from fresh human blood to prevent himself from losing control of his hunger, Blade often uses a special serum as opposed to actually draining any humans. With so many strengths and so little weaknesses, Blade is definitely a blood-sucking force to be reckoned with. Coming in at number 8, we have Frank Castle, aka The Punisher. Now, The Punisher obviously fits the bill as an anti-hero, but is he really one of the most powerful? Well, despite his lack of actual superhuman abilities, The Punisher is considered to be at the absolute peak of non-enhanced human performance, with a long military history and years of physical combat training. However, the truly most terrifying thing about The Punisher is his dedication to his cause. While other heroes may may shy away from violence and especially murder, the Punisher has no such qualms. And the fear that the Marvel Universe's villains feel towards a hero that's willing to get as dirty as they are, that's some pretty intense stuff and definitely deserving of a spot on this list. At number 7, we have Johnny Blaze, aka the Fiery Ghost Rider. After Johnny made a deal with the villain Mephisto, a demon that just loves to try and steal the souls and happiness of various superheroes for some reason, he became the Ghost Rider, capable of combining his form with that of a spirit of vengeance known as Zarathos. Completely immune to any sort of physical attack unless it was made by a weapon of angelic origin, Johnny is able to manipulate and control Hellfire, one of the most dangerous substances in the entire Marvel Universe that burns not only physical objects, but the soul or essence of them as well. While he's veered towards the dark side with his hellish abilities several times over the years, Johnny overall strives towards redemption and using his demonic powers for something at least slightly close to good. Coming in at number 6, we're gonna have to go with the famous, or should I say, infamous Deadpool. Originally a villain for the X-Force, Deadpool has over the years turned into a charming and fourth wall breaking anti-hero that's always trying to do some form of good, but sometimes shows it in some pretty odd and violent ways. However, the most notable aspect of Deadpool's powers and what makes him so powerful is his sheer inability to die. No matter how many times you stab him, shoot him, or chop some bits off, Deadpool will always bounce back with at least a couple of bad jokes. Add in his not insignificant skill with all manner of firearms and weaponry, and you've got an explosive anti-hero that you wouldn't want to mess with. Coming in at number 5, we've got Loki. And while he may may not be the crown prince of Asgard, he's definitely the crown prince of changing allegiances. While Loki's motivations and goals have changed frequently over his vast history, with the only consistent characterization being that of a wild card, his strength and the level of his powers has maintained a particularly high quality. Combining the strengths of both his frost giant genetics and his Asgardian upbringing, Loki would be formidable even without his mastery of magic and deception, showing that power isn't just about lifting heavy things or swinging a magical hammer, but can be just as effective scheming behind the scenes. Plus, you know, 
being as handsome as Tom Hiddleston probably doesn't hurt. Coming in at number 4 is the underrated hero The Sentry, an expert on being torn between good and evil. While I've spoken before on this channel about The Sentry being one of the most physically powerful beings in the entire Marvel multiverse, the most interesting aspect of his powers is his manifestation of the Void, an equally powerful dark version of his Power of a Million Suns based abilities. With the Void and the Sentry actually being two halves of the same person, and their internal struggle being so devastating as to put the entire world at risk, the Sentry has actually had the world's memory of him wiped on several occasions, just to prevent the Void's powers from being abused. At number 3 we have the Scarlet Witch, also known as Wanda Maximoff. Originally believing herself to be the mutant daughter of Magneto, Wanda is in reality one of the most powerful magic wielders in the Marvel multiverse, and a conduit for chaos magic that allows her to rewrite reality to her will. While Wanda may have been one of the most notable Avengers for a time, she's also struggled with her powers during events that wiped mutants off the face of the earth and brought her own children into existence existence through willpower alone. No matter what reality changing adventures she's caught up in, Wanda Maximoff will always be one of the most powerful beings in the entire Marvel Universe. Coming in at number 2, we've got the character that personally first pops up when I think of the word anti-hero with the iconic Venom. From Spider-Man's edgier looking costume, to a bulky web slinging supervillain, to the lethal protector of San Francisco, Venom has held more jobs over the years than I have, which is honestly saying a lot. But with the recent defeat of the dark symbiote god known as Null, Venom has become the leader of the symbiotes and thus has one of the most unstoppable armies in the entire Marvel multiverse at his beck and call. Let's hope that Venom keeps on leaning on the hero part of anti-hero, because otherwise this guy would be a serious problem for the rest of the universe. And finally, coming in at the number one spot, we have the leader of the Brotherhood of Mutants and the master of magnetism, Magneto. While some may know him as the most notable villain the X-Men have ever faced, labeling Magneto as solely a villain is simplifying his tragic story far too much. Having rejoined with Professor X in recent years and been a major contributor to the new mutant home island of Krakoa, Magneto's dedication to the mutant race is only dwarfed by the powers he possesses. Capable of altering the very magnetic fields that hold the universe together, Magneto's abilities go far beyond the he can control metal simplification that his name seems to suggest. Magneto was recently able to help terraform the entire planet of Mars, and the version of him from the Mars Marvel Ultimate Universe was even able to nearly single handedly wipe out humanity himself just by reversing the planet's polarity. AKA, he's definitely more powerful than something you'd usually associate with sticking to your refrigerator. Number 10 Strife. Strife is a pretty weird dude, especially as he's the exact staple of an evil clone. You know when people tell you they have an evil clone and it wasn't them, but often in stories no one believes them? This is actually what Strife is for Cable. Deadpool actually tried using that line once, and in fact it was actually true at the time, and people didn't believe him either. Don't worry Cable. Strife has been mistaken for Cable on multiple occasions. When Strife shot Professor X, everyone wrongly thought that it was Cable, not yet knowing that Cable had an evil clone. Strife has also attempted to impersonate Cable before, trying to act as Hope's father during the events of Messiah War. All in all, Strife is kinda just an evil weirdo who also happens to be a lot more powerful than Cable, as he doesn't suffer from the techno-organic virus like the original Nathan Christopher Summers does. Strife is also the son of Apocalypse, which of course instantly makes him pretty weird and pretty evil. Number 9 Joseph Joseph is the younger mutant clone of former villain and current anti hero Magneto, who is also known for being one of the most powerful mutants besides. Joseph initially started out as an anti hero himself. He was created by Astra, who was actually retconned to be Magneto's first recruit for his Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. Astra hoped the clone would be able to kill Magneto, but her plan failed, and Joseph ended up lost. And without his memories. Unable to remember who he was, those who took him in believed him to be an amnesiac Magneto, despite the fact that he seemed much younger than the villain. Initially, Joseph sacrificed himself to save the world from Magneto, but he would later be brought back by Astra, only to become a villain and a new leader of his own brotherhood. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and, like I said, you want more clones, you know what to do. Hit that like button, comment down below, and why not share for your friends that also love clones? 
<laughs> Number 8. Mr. Sinister's Chimera Granted, this at least wasn't as weird as I thought it could be. I was expecting it to get a lot weirder. Still, this clone was startling enough that the Hellions, specifically Empath, were forced to take it down. As was alluded to in Incoming, Sinister was hellbent on creating a super powerful mutant that would be a Chimera, a blend of multiple genes. Even though he was technically sworn as a member of the Quiet Council and in general as a citizen of Krakoa to perform no more cloning, but you know Nathaniel Essex, Sinister's got a clone. Hence, in the Hellions issue number 15, we finally got to meet Mr. Sinister's newest creation and his pride and joy. This chimera was a blend of Sinister and his Iraqi rival Tarn the Uncaring, which I gotta say is a pretty weird yet epically powerful combo, making his chimera one of the most powerful mutants out there and an Omega level mutant. Mutant clone. Number 7, Kane Parker. Kane was a defective clone of Peter Parker, one of the multiple created by the villain Jackal. Kane, unlike clone Ben Riley, though, was seen as being more villainous, or at least more questionable when it came to his methods. Kane has always been known for having less of a moral compass and is also often associated with a more moody look with his long, flowing locks. His signature ability is the Mark of Kane, which is actually the same ability that allows Spider Man to wall crawl. For Kane, though, the little spider like hooks on his hands are more abrasive, which means that he can actually lay his hands on someone and use them to burn his victims. It's like the opposite of laying hands in D&D. Number 6, Linda the Duck. You guessed right, even Howard the Duck has a clone in the Marvel Universe. Linda the Duck was actually created along with another character's female version. The Collector is the one responsible for her creation, apparently making her for reproductive and potentially breeding purposes. That's all can of worms that I, I really don't want to open up on the internet, but I suppose you could if you so chose. Linda would end up escaping the Collector and traveling back in time to before she ever existed or before she ever escaped, meaning that no one was looking for her at that time so she could live her life safely. A pretty smart plan for staying hidden and operating under the radar. Number 5. Shock It Raccoon Somehow Linda's partner in crime Shock It Raccoon is an even more surprising clone to me. Shock It Raccoon is, you guessed it, the female clone version of Rocket Raccoon. She was also created for reproductive, potentially breeding purposes. Shock It along with Linda also escaped the collector's collection after being made by Tanelier Tavon. However, it was only due to assistance from the gatherer D3X that they even got out at all. Gatherer D3X was instructed to put them back into cryogenic stasis, but actually rebelled against his master and decided to escape alongside Shocket and Linda. Sadly, it wouldn't work out too well for him in the end, but Shocket and Linda are still probably good. They might be in another universe though now. Number 4, Kindred. In a masterful turn of events, it was revealed that Kindred's true identity was actually more complicated than just being Harry Osborn. Instead, Kindred was really two different people, Gabriel and Sarah Stacy, the illegitimate children of Norman Osborn and Gwen Stacy. Dun dun dun! But there was even an added twist on that reveal. I know, how shocking. Gabriel and Sarah, it turns out, were actually creations of Harry Osborn. He combined his father and Gwen's DNA to make the two clones and implanted memories in Mary Jane Watson's and Norman Osborn's minds to make them think that the twins were really Norman and Gwen's biological offspring, making them think that Norman had slept with Gwen and that she had given birth to the twins secretly in France. However, this was not at all true it turns out, and the twins were actually just created by Harry to torment both his father and his old friend, Peter Parker, aka Spider-Man old friend slash rival. That's right, they retcon the retcon and I am so happy about it. These clones might be weird and ultimately degenerate pretty quick, but I'm really happy that they are weird clones and that the relationship between Norman and Gwen was simply an illusion. Thank you Mysterio, thank you Harry, Thank you, Nick Spencer. Number three, Harry Osborn. And surprisingly, Kindred wasn't even the weirdest clone for me, involved in the most recent Spider-Man plot, which wraps up Nick Spencer's run on The Amazing Spider-Man. Harry Osborn also ends up having a clone, and it's revealed that the version of him that was locked up this whole time is the real Harry. Not the real Harry, really, but a clone. We'll get to that in a minute. The Harry that we thought was Kindred was actually Gabriel and Sarah using chameleon disguise tech to impersonate Harry. However, it turns out this Actual Harry isn't, well, actually Harry, who remains dead in the comics. He's actually a clone who was created by Norman after the death of his son, which it turns out he just couldn't live with. 
He made it appear as though Harry had actually survived due to him being exposed to the goblin serum. In the end, Harry realizes that he's a clone, coming to terms with the fact that he was the one behind the plot to create Gabriel and Sarah in order to hurt both Norman and Peter. He chooses to make amends and ultimately sacrifices himself, but in the end, at least he gets closure for doing so, finally able to confess his misdeeds and redeem himself once and for all. Bye, Harry clone. You will be missed. Number 2, Captain Zolandia. Captain Zolandia is the really messed up mutated clone of Steve Rogers, and he's not the only mutated clone that Arnim Zola goes on to create in Dimension Z or Dimension Z, depending on where you're watching. He claims to have all the memories of Captain America, and while beating him up, uses these memories to torment Steve, trying to plant seeds of self-doubt in regards to Rogers' heroic beliefs and mission. Captain Zolandia would also go on to become the leader of the Unvengers team as well, which is a team that also features other messed up clones of other main Avengers team members. Look under your seat! Everyone gets a mutated clone! You get one! And you! And you! Mutated clones for everybody! Number 1, Ian Rogers. Ian is a clone of both Arnim Zola and Steve Rogers. He's like... Captain Zola's clone baby, I guess. He was initially created by Arnim Zola in Dimension Z, which is where Cap found the test tube baby and rescued him. Cap would spend years trapped in that dimension with Ian and would kind of raise him as his own son. However, Ian would be kidnapped by Zola and ultimately brainwashed against Cap. Oh no. Cap would then have to help dismantle this brainwashing to free Ian once more from Zola's grasp and his influence. And really, everything involving Ian gets even weirder from there. He would eventually go on to take up the name Nomad and for a time would become the ally and partner of Sam Wilson's Captain America. Number 10, Punisher 2099. Punisher 2099 is Jacob Gallows. He hails from the alternate dystopian future of Earth 928, where mega corporations pretty much own and run everything on planet Earth. Jacob himself is a police officer working for the public eye, a privatized police force owned and operated by Alchemax. After suffering an injustice with his brother, sister in law, and mother being killed after a hit was put on them by Kron Stone, the son of Alchemax's CEO, Jake decided to take matters into his own hands. Finding the war journal of the Punisher of years before, he was inspired to become a vigilante all his own, and ended up carrying on Frank Castle's work and title, but with the aid of future technology and tracking. Punisher 2099 would eventually end up with a bionic arm, which also made him an even better fighter than he was previously, boosting his skills. Number 9, Deathlock Prime. There have been a few different versions of Deathlock that we've seen throughout the years. All of them have been pretty futuristic in the sense that they are cyborgs who also generally come equipped with advanced weaponry. But at least one Deathlock is actually also hailed from the future. The one I'm talking about here is Deathlock Prime, who came from the alternate future of Earth 10511, a reality where Roxxon, typically the corporation behind the creation of Deathlocks in most series, have taken over the entire planet Earth. Deathlocks were employed in this future in a sort of Terminator-esque Skynet way to squash the resistance by traveling back in time and killing the enemies of Roxxon to prevent any of them from rising up in the future. Gotta love that Skynet ploy. And friends, before I move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want to learn more about future superheroes, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Number 8, Iron Lad. Iron Lad is a hard one to rank because he's actually a Mortis and therefore also Kang the Conqueror, two very powerful villains in the Marvel Universe who often are known for traveling through time and assuming new identities throughout the years. However, because many of his other identities are considered villainous, we are going to actually rank Iron Lad based on what he was capable of more as Iron Lad, which is why he's a little lower on our list in comparison to if I was ranking him as, you know, Kang. Iron Lad was one of the original members of the Young Avengers, but later learned that he was destined to become the villain known as Kang over time, as he continued to try and set up his future to be perfect. Iron Lad, aka Nathaniel Richards rebelled against his future self, however, killing Kang and attempting to alter his own future. However, Iron Lad's fate was not so easy to beat, and he would eventually end up working with and becoming his future villainous selves. Self. Selves. There's multiple of them. Selves. 
Number 7. Captain America 3099 Captain America 3099 is one of the uniforms you can get in Marvel Future Fight, a mobile dungeon crawler style action RPG game set in the Marvel Universe. While we've been to 2099 in the comics, 3099 offers an even more futuristic look at some of our favorite heroes. Cap's 3099 uniform includes a digital, still physical but appearing kinda holographic if that makes sense, a shield. Cap also sports some interesting pieces of armor including boots, a chest plate, and pauldrons that also look super futuristic with highlights of glowing neon blue light inlaid into them. This uniform showed up earlier last year and can be unlocked by playing through story mode for the third time. I believe. I think you can still unlock it that way. Number 6. Spider-Man 2099 Spider-Man 2099 is Miguel O'Hara. He hails from the alternate reality belonging to 2099, or really one of the 2099 realities really, Earth 928. In 2099, Miguel becomes Spider-Man as a result of an experimental dream he was pressured to work on as a brilliant geneticist employed by Alchemax. The drug has so far killed a man who he tested it on, which is why Miguel actually tries to leave, but Miguel was forced to try it himself after trying to leave the company, only for his boss to sneak a highly addictive hallucinogenic into his drink that only Alchemax made. Miguel miraculously survived the transformative process, despite the experiment being additionally sabotaged in an attempt to kill him. In the end, Miguel was left with a power set similar to the Spider-Man of the past and ended up becoming the Spider-Man of the future. Since his introduction, Miguel O'Hara has become a huge fan favorite and has even made his way over to Earth 616 for a few team ups with main continuity Spider-Man Peter Parker. Number 5. Bishop Bishop is a mutant from an alternate dystopian future, which is kind of a thing with mutants if you haven't already noticed that before. There are a lot of mutants who come from the future, specifically various different dystopian futures. Lucas Bishop in his future was a mutant who joined up with the XSE in his timeline, known as the Xavier Security Enforcers. Bishop's powers allow him to absorb almost any type of energy, including kinetic energy, even energy from a snowfall, store up said energy, and and disperse it using it to boost or heal himself or to fire concussive blasts at his opponents. Number 4. All Father Doom In the year 2099, Doctor Doom becomes a hero. There were actually two Dooms who appeared, and initially it seemed like the Victor Von Doom that we'd come to know may not actually be the true Doom. After all, he was younger and unscarred at his first appearance. However, this would actually be explained in time, and it would be revealed that the other, more villainous Doom was a brainwashed imposter, Eric Zerny, in truth. In fact, there weren't even just two Dooms. There were, there were kind of three, if you're counting Tiger Wild, a cyborg who became dictator of life. Latveria. He didn't necessarily go by the name Doctor Doom, but definitely had a kind of Doom vibe going on with his metal cyborg self and being a tyrannical ruler of Latveria. The real Doom ended up being the last one standing in the end and used his power for good. True, he does set out to conquer the United States, but this is actually a good thing as he aims to do so for heroic reasons, wanting to take down the mega corporations who basically now control all aspects of the nation and its civilians' lives in the future. He even even brings back shield, which is pretty good, I think. Number 3. Cable Probably one of the most powerful superheroes out there, period, is Cable. Cable is little baby Nathaniel Christopher Charles Summers, initially referred to as Baby Christopher in the comics, all grown up. Cable actually goes to the future and then comes back to the past after having a roller coaster of a life. He is the biological son of Scott Summers, aka Cyclops, and Madeline Pryor, aka the Goblin Queen, and also Jean Grey's clone. Jean herself is also a mother to Cable, thinking of him as her own son, and having met memories implanted in her mind of his childhood. So to Jean, she also is his mom. And to Cable, Jean is also his mom too. Being the child of such powerful mutants means that Cable himself is an immensely powerful telepath and telekinetic, despite the fact that he has to focus a lot of his mental strength on fending off the techno-organic virus, which he was infected with. He's also an immensely skilled combatant capable of time travel. Number 2. Cosmic Ghost Rider Cosmic Ghost Rider comes to us from a very bleak future where Thanos ends up winning the day. So many bleak futures in Marvel. And I mean Thanos really wins the day by the way, like in an awful way. Cosmic Ghost Rider was once Frank Castle who ended up becoming a spirit of vengeance but returned to Earth too late, after everyone was dead and there was basically nothing left to avenge. Driven insane by years of loneliness, he ended up becoming a herald of Galactus and being granted the power cosmic in a final bid to try and defeat Thanos. When this failed, he joined the tyrant himself and became his own herald, cause I mean what else are you gonna do? However, this reality was wiped from existence when a past version of Thanos met his older self who had destroyed almost everything in the galaxy at that point. King 
Thanos. Younger Thanos found him pretty pathetic and vowed to never become him, returning home and causing King Thanos' reality to crumble, and King Thanos to never have existed. However, Cosmic Ghost Rider would be given a place in Valhalla, and from there be given the chance to return to the world of the living by Odin himself, who sensed that he was unhappy in Valhalla. Cosmic Ghost Rider is not only super powerful at this point, but has also been around since the beginning of Marvel continuity now, having tons of knowledge about the universe as he ultimately decided to sit back and watch it all unfold, knowing that avoiding its demise was pretty much inevitable. Cause he already tried that. Number 1. Prestige When it comes to Jean Grey and Cyclops, they really have more alternate or future kids than they do main continuity ones. Rachel Summers aka Prestige being no exception here. She hails from the alternate dystopian future belonging to Earth 811, where she is the daughter of her own reality's version of Jean and Scott. Although oddly enough on Earth 616, she does pretty much also think of the main continuity versions of her parents as her true parents as well. Which I guess in a way they sort of are, it's just they didn't end up going down the path that leads to Earth 811. Earth 811 is the days of future past reality to give you an idea of just how dystopian we're talking about here. Rachel is even more powerful than her brother from a different reality, Cable. She also has been a host for the Phoenix Force and has better control and use of her abilities and powers. She also doesn't have the techno organic virus distracting her and eating away at some of her power, meaning that she operates almost always at full power levels, which is pretty intense because Rachel's really powerful. Also, I dare everyone to go back and now count how many times I said dystopian future in this video. I feel like I said that a lot. Coming in number 10, we've got Wasp. Janet Van Dyne, synonymous with stinging insects across the world. She's also known for infecting important individuals and wreaking plenty of havoc. We're not really sure how or when she got infected, but that doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things. On Earth 2149, the zombie plague spread quickly and she had a lot to do with it. Hero zombification doesn't turn the supers into shambling brainless creatures like so many other apocalypses do. It instills them with a thirst for blood, a hunger for flesh, and the ability to create even more zombies. So of course, Wasp went to find her husband, Henry Pym, aka Giant Man. We'll come back to that in a bit. After infecting Pym, they got right down to business. She called a false Avengers Assemble and picked off the folks who ended up showing up, eventually discovering that Pym was hiding T'Challa from her. Overcome by zombie hunger, she attacked Pym but was decapitated. Still alive, mind you, but without a body to call her own. So for a while, Wasp remained just a head, traveling through the universe in what can simply be called a jar. Eventually, she managed to procure a cybernetic body for her zombie dome. Absolutely wild. Coming in number 9 we've got Red Skull. A big part of one of the zombie stories was the fight against and then upon Galactus. Like usually his appearance would be an enormous one with all sorts of supers having to put it all on the line to put an end to his plans. In zombies though Galactus falls to the undead heroes and villains rather quickly. Using a crazy gun that shot beams of pure concentrated energy Galactus was cut down promptly. This wasn't the end of it though as hero and villain zombies descended upon the enormous corpse to feed. These two groups fought it out to earn the meal, which brought Captain, or Colonel in this case, America and Red Skull face to face. Enemies even in the undead afterlife, eh? Usually one would expect the patriotic pummeler to win this kind of fight, but in zombies, Red Skull scoops out his foe's brain. That's it for America. Coming in number 8 we've got Wolverine. After fighting the good fight when the zombies showed up, eventually Wolverine fell and got turned into a zombie himself. Ouch. Keeping all of his classic powers but earning a brand new hunger, he's a force to be reckoned with. He plows through countless deadites with ease and then scares the Necronomicon until it begs not to be eaten. Wolverine doesn't eat books, but he does use them for TP. Oh boy. That's just the beginning of Wolverine's zombified adventure though. He sniffs out a bunch of survivors and brings a bunch of zombies together to fight Magneto. Interestingly enough, he tries to fight Silver Surfer after this, but his necrotized flesh can't hold his claws when he strikes. This doesn't make him useless though, as he still is able to literally toss Iron Man into the fight. In fact, Wolverine is still powerful enough as an undead corpse to kill Juggernaut, among other classic characters. Then he and some other zombies head to space, thinking they've already eaten all of of the unsullied flesh on Earth. Coming in at number 7 we've got Reed Richards. This is a universe spanning tale of tragedy if there ever has been one. Poor Reed. He watched his children get annihilated by zombie She-Hulk and lost his mind completely. Even before he's zombified he dives deep down the zombie rabbit hole, learning about how they function, how efficient they can be and more. 
This disturbs those around him who are shocked at how interested he is in the creatures that kill his family. In the end, he infects the remaining members of the Fantastic Four without their knowledge and they all turn right in front of him. Then they turn him and the zombie Fantastic Four is ready to roll. Imagine having the power to keep people alive but instead using the research to turn your friends into zombies. The people who trusted you! Insane. Worse still, the zombie foursome finds Tony Stark and turn him into a zombie before he can get his suit on. And that opens up a whole new can of worms. Coming in number 6 we've got Captain Marvel, ah Carol Danvers. As if she couldn't stir up enough controversy by starring in her own movie a few years back, we've also got her piloting a long dead Galactus towards Earth in Zombies Respawn. Folks know she's bad news as soon as they see her as an unzombified Wolverine tells his whole squad to fall back. Too late though as she is ready to bring the zombie apocalypse to earth once more. All of her powers are essentially the same as they've ever been but her mission has changed. Consume the planet many had assumed she swore to protect. Bad news all around for sure. Coming in number 5 we've got Mystique. Now this is some next level zombie intelligence right here. Mystique is known for using her shape shifting abilities to mess things up across the board for sure but what about when she essentially ends the world with one simple trick? Doctors hate her that's for sure. She takes on the form of Scarlet Witch, chills with Wanda's brother Quicksilver and turns the speedster into a zombie. Then Quicksilver decides it's a fine idea to zip all over the world at max speed turning every other available person. That is beyond the butterfly effect. That's like the uh, butterfly sanctuary full of freshly metamorphosed morphosed creatures effect. Coming in number 4 we've got Quicksilver. Like I just explained, this super fast freak gets turned and makes the zombie infection a global pandemic before anybody can do anything about it. You think we've witnessed the quick spread of a virus recently? Think again. Sure, planes, trains and automobiles will eventually get the job done but Pietro here makes it happen in seconds flat. That's gotta be a record or something. So in terms of people with the highest rate of turning others into zombies, it seems that Quicksilver ran away with the competition. Easy peasy right? Coming in number 3 we've got Hank Pym. We mentioned him earlier in the list when discussing the deeds of his wife but Giant Man got up to some heinous stuff while operating as a zombie. The zombies are so good at eating and infecting that they soon ruin their food supply. Some suggest exploring the universe to find other new sources of nourishment, others claim that they should be able to eat each other. That second idea falls on its face though when zombies realize that zombie meat tastes bad. However there are plenty of fine enterprising minds in the Marvel Universe. Hank Pym is just one of those geniuses and he comes up with a plan. Breeding and cloning humans to come up with an infinite supply of food. How wonderful. Just like factory farms but for people. I can only imagine what kind of awful cruel things would happen in such a facility but here we are. It never really works out thankfully but still. Pim also captures and restrains T'Challa at one point, saving him for when he gets really hungry. He won't turn if all Pim does is hack off a limb or two. Coming in number 2 we've got Spider Man. Here's a hard one to handle. Peter Parker turning into a zombie and giving up on all of the goodness in his heart. Sheesh. A lot of folks were really freaked out by the actions Spider-Man took once zombified. Like eating the flesh of fellow heroes is a tough start but Peter even went home and feasted on Mary Jane and Aunt May. Not cool Peter. After one hell of a feeding frenzy on earth, Spidey and a bunch of other heroes take to the stars looking for more flesh to consume. This eventually results in them eating most of the food in the known universe. Is a New York slice not enough anymore? Absolutely gutted at what he's done, Spider-Man isn't exactly sure what to do. He's out here shooting webs made of veins and arteries, hungering after an infinite source of food that no longer exists. Even when he's fired into a new universe he can't control himself. After all he has learned that zombie virus just takes over. Sheesh. And finally at number 1 we've got the Hulk. Bruce Banner and his big green pal tend to be pretty scary on a regular day but when zombie viruses show up things can get really raunchy. Usually Banner finds a way to reel in his alter ego and remain pretty affable but not zombie Hulk. He is a crazed destructive lunatic with nothing to lose. He'll kill and eat and kill and eat and kill and eat until there is nothing left which is exactly what he does. The zombification does nothing to rob him of his strength either. Hell, when Thanos accuses him of being the reason every zombie is so ticked off and hungry in deep space, Zombie Hulk just destroys his head. Insane. I didn't even mention what he did to Silver Surfer's head. This is a green undead freak that you do not want to cross at all. Zombie superheroes might not be the most long lasting and legendary iterations but they're a whole lot of fun. And I'm sure that this upcoming what if series will touch on them at some point. 